uh, having Brother J.D. do this chapter. He's not been in a shipwreck, but he's certainly been in the Navy. And some of the times him talking about those storms they were in in the Navy, I'm certainly glad I wasn't on that ship. I can promise you that. And had it been one of these wooden boxes like in this chapter, it would have probably came apart as well. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so this is a, in this chapter, the Apostle Paul, he's going to begin his journey towards Rome. And uh, that journey, of course, will be via a ship. We'll see that in just a moment. Paul is at this time still a prisoner. And in spite of Paul being a prisoner, he will warn the centurion in this, uh, in this chapter not to take this trip. Nonetheless, they will not heed Paul's warning and they take the trip anyway. And it's not very far into the trip but they encounter a severe storm. So I'm going to read the chapter. It is a lengthy chapter. There's 44 verses, I believe. We will make brief comment along the way as we go through the chapter. And then in our next lesson, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll come back. I'll look at a lot of things in the chapter again. And we'll talk about the sea, the ship, and the storm, and how all of that relates to the Christian life. But just for today, I want to just read through the chapter and make some comments as we go along. So let's pray together, and we'll just begin in verse number one, and we'll make mention of some things as we go. Father, we do love you. We do thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to be assembled together, and we thank you for the good songs and the good singing. And my, how our heart rejoices that we have a wonderful Savior. I'm so grateful, Lord, that you have made a way for us to be saved. And your grace has not only saved us, it continues with us through the journey. And Lord, one day it'll safely take us home. We're grateful for that. Would you help us today as we read this chapter, share some truths as we go along. And Lord, we'll sure thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. This is one of those chapters in the Bible that's just fun to read, just a lot of exciting information and enjoyable reading. Maybe I should label it that way. Verse number one says, And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion. So Festus, from the previous chapter, the governor and possibly uh, King Agrippa, they have delivered uh, Paul unto Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band, and entered into a ship of Adramidum. We launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched on Sidon. And Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go into his friends or unto his friends and to refresh himself. Now, I don't know if you've noticed or not or paid any attention or not, but throughout the, the Bible, especially the New Testament thus far, we have not one time met a centurion that was not a very humane and gracious individual. We see that case here again with Julius. We haven't came across a bad centurion yet in the Bible. They all seem to be pretty good men. They are kind and courteous. I'll remind you just briefly Upon witnessing the crucifixion in Luke chapter 24, or chapter 23, verse 47, the Bible says, Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Earlier than that, in Luke chapter 7, there was a centurion who had a servant that was sick, and he made reference to the fact, or mentioned to the fact, that he was not worthy of Jesus coming to his house, nor was he worthy of being in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 7 and verse number 9. Jesus said this concerning this centurion. He said, I have not found so great faith, no, not in all Israel. And of course, you know the story of Acts chapter 10 where Cornelius was a centurion. The Bible says this about him. He was a devout man that feared God. And so here we have a, a good centurion as well. We may mention this again later in this chapter. This centurion gave Paul liberty. 
Paul was able to go see his friends. Uh, the Bible says at the end of verse number three, and he was able to refresh himself. I think the centurion probably gave uh, the apostle Paul liberty not only to visit with his friends, maybe to, to have a shower, shave, whatever the case may have been, but he gave him liberty to see his friends and refresh himself. Now, notice again, we, we could have made mention of it in verse number one, where the Bible says, and when it was determined that we should sail. Notice again in verse number four, and when we had launched from thence. Remember that Paul, not Paul, Luke, is the human penman. He is the man that God has used to pen the book of Acts. And so we are, uh, is made known to us here, verse number one, now again in verse number four, that Luke is also with him on this journey. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lacria. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come again against Syndicus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmonim. And hardly passing it, came into a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was a city of Lycia. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. And we'll talk about that, what Paul said to them in just a moment. So apparently there are certain times of the year when sailing is good and advantageous, if you want to use that terminology. The winds are, are good for sailing. The winds are good for getting you to the journey that you or the destination you're intended to take. Uh, it seems from what I understand, the winds would blow you from Africa and from Asia up into Italy and even up into Europe. They, they didn't, Paul is, is the time that they are about to sail, they're not going to catch those winds. They're not going to make it uh, in time to catch those winds at all. In fact, they are going to encounter some, they have already encountered some bad headwinds that have held them up. And so this time of year, this, this particular time of year when there are apparently big storms hit and it was past the proper time that they should be sailing. And so verse number nine says again, now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because of the, the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them, verse 10, this is what he said. And he said unto them, sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. So Paul here, he warns the people, he warns the, the captain, he warns the centurion, the sailors, whoever will listen, Paul is warning them that if we take this journey, if we continue on this plan or this path that is intended for us, there's going to be trouble. Now, it, obviously, they are not interested in listening to Paul. Here, Paul is. He's, he's not a sailor. Paul is not a, in charge at all. He is a prisoner. He is a Jew. And they, are, they, you know, they don't seem to be paying him any attention at all. And we can, we can certainly understand this. Here's this man that is a, a prisoner. And he is boarding our ship. And he is trying to give us instruction as to whether or not we should be sailing or whether or not we should be leaving port. And so they're not, they're not paying a lot of attention to him at all. Verse number 11 says, Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also. If by any means they might attain to fence there and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. So when they first began this voyage, when they first began this journey, 
Uh, everything seems to be okay. The winds are, seem to be in their favor. Uh, the Bible says the south winds blew softly. Every time I read that passage of scripture, every time I read this chapter, I think about those little Madeira girls when they were growing up here uh, singing that song, I Believe God, and I still can't believe no one in our church has learned that song and sang it for me, so I'll just throw that out there. But uh, it, it, I'm reminded of that every time that I, I read this chapter, the, the south, everything Thing was going real good. They, they had a warning. They didn't heed the warning. They began the journey, and in the beginning, things seemed to be going uh, favorable to them. But verse 14 begins with this word, but. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. Now, if I understand correctly, this is a European cyclone. Now, I, I've never been in a cyclone. I think they're best. I, I don't know much about weather patterns and weather stuff. I think it's uh, a hurricane is what it is. And so this is a, uh, it's a strong tempestuous wind. This is in the Mediterranean Sea. So it would be a Mediterranean Sea hurricane. And, but, but here's what you know. I want you to notice how quickly things can change. In verse number 13, the Bible said a south wind blew softly, but in verse number 14, the Bible says there arose against them a tempestuous wind. You know, in our lives, things change quickly. It, it seems that one, one verse of our life, maybe we could say one hour of our life, everything seems to be going along smoothly, the wind's blowing softly, the breeze is gentle, everything is okay. But the very next verse, or the very next hour, we could be in the most tumultuous, the most tumultuous time in in our life. We we could have all kinds of problems quickly. Life changes quickly. That's why it's such a blessing to know that we have such a wonderful Savior that we sing about. Uh, irregardless if things are going well or if things are not going well. I'm glad that we have a God that does not change and he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Now I want to say, I don't want to get into this too deeply. I'm going to, to pre preach an entire sermon about this a little later. But I'll tell you, it's a good thing, it's a good thing to listen to the preacher. It's a good thing to listen to the man of God. He may not have been a sailor. He may have not had a, a lot of authority concerning when to sail, when not to sail. He may have not known a lot about uh, the seas and the storms and all that, but he knows God. And, and the Lord had told him, he had received revelation from the Lord that it's not a good time to be, to be sailing. Sometimes it may seem to you that the preacher doesn't know a whole lot, and oftentimes I don't. But I know one thing, I have a Bible and I have a God and God has given us direction and God has given us his word and so I may not be an authority on this subject or that subject or any subject as far as that goes. I'll tell you this, it's a good thing to be obedient to what thus saith the Lord. If we're not, we get ourselves in trouble. So the preacher is not just telling you stuff because he's trying to control your life. He's trying to tell you what the Bible says, what thus saith the Lord, and it does good to pay attention and follow that. Amen. Now, verse 15. The Bible says, let me read verse 14 again, but not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon, and when the ship was called and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. I like that phrase, we let her drive. Anytime you men want to face some kind of adventure in your life or some kind of storm in your life, just pull over and let her drive, amen? There's, there's, there's no telling how that'll work out. Amen. I, I don't think that's what it means, but it, it sounded good at the time, amen? Uh, I've actually gotten to the, to the place where I, I used to never want my wife to drive. Now I beg her to drive and she won't. How in the world does that work out? But um, anyway, uh, so... Actually, they're in the ship now, and the storm has, is raging. The storm is very bad, and uh, the ship is at the mercy of the storm. This, ha this has to be unbelievably terrifying. They have lost all control of the ship. They have no control of the ship at all whatsoever. They're just letting the ship go. They're letting her drive. It's taking its own course of action. It's going wherever the wind and the waves are tossing it. It's just, that's just how it's going. They're letting it drive. Look at verse 16. 
and running under a certain island, which is called Claudia, we had much work to come by the boat. So they're trying, in verse number 16, they're trying to regain control of the vessel. They're trying to regain control of the ship. Verse 17 says, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strike sail, and so were driven. Now, I'm, I'm not even going to pretend that I know anything about sailing. I don't. You know how I feel about water. So you know how many times I've been on a boat. <laughs> not, not many. I used to go on a little John boat out in a lake uh, bass fishing years ago when I was dumber. And uh, I care. Those little bitty ripple waves in the lake was more than my stomach could stand in a John boat. I have no, I have no desire at all whatsoever to be out in the ocean, the sea, or anything else in any kind of boat. Maybe somebody will take my wife on a cruise one of these days, and I'll stay home and pray for y'all that you don't fall in and there's no storm. But, any, but, it, but here, I, I can understand just by reading this that the storm is harming the ship. The storm is harming the vessel. And the men have, to begin with, they just let it go. They just let it drive. They let it go its own way. And now it seems that they're trying to, the Bible uses the term, they're using helps. They're undergirding the ships. They, they are concerned that the, the, the ship is going to fall into quicksand and strike sail. And so they're trying to figure out how to, to get the mass back up, get the sails back up. Uh, maybe, maybe they're, they're, they haven't got blown out in the storm or all destroyed in the storm. And so they're trying to do all that they can to, to save the vessel, if you will. Now, I guess the only thing that would be as scary, to me, it would be as scary, um, than, a, than being in a storm in a sea and the ship falling apart would be flying in an airplane and it falling apart. I, I don't know which would be worse, but I'd about soon take my chances of jumping out of the plane with a drop cord. I don't know, it would get hung over something <laughs> on the way down, and you'd be all right. But you, you don't have no hope in that sea, man. If, if you don't drown, something's going to eat you. I'm, I'm done with that place. <laughs> but uh, so, so, you know, there, there, it's got to be a horrible situation. These, we're, we'll find out in a minute. These, these men have absolutely no hope at all whatsoever. They're, this vessel is being torn apart, and uh, they're, they're doing what they can to try. Look, it's not like a car. Well, I'll tell you, I don't know. A car breaking down the interstate is about, about, as, bad as, a, about as bad as a boat falling apart or a plane falling apart. You have to get out there and fight them 18-wheelers to try to change a flat. I remember we just come back from Florida many years ago. My wife and I was, we'd been to Bible conference at Brother James's and our van tore up on the way, on the way back. Really the only time I've ever had any trouble all these years of traveling. I praise the Lord for that. But the, the vehicle tore up and, and we had to pull over to the side of the road on the side of uh, 95. Man, I, I'll tell you, I, I drove the, I just got the van going after it sat there and cooled off a while. A belt had broke on it, a pulley had locked up. And I said, hey, there's no way I'm doing anything to this thing on the side of this road. I'm scared to death standing on the back side of the vehicle. Every time a truck come by, the van shake like that. But um, I don't know how I got off on that. I don't like trouble. Amen. Verse number 18 says, and we being exceedingly, exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lighted the ship, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. So they, they have this ideal if we, if, we, if we get rid of the burden, if we get rid of the load on the ship, maybe we'll have a better chance of survival. Um, all of a sudden, it isn't amazing how when things come up in your life, this... All of a sudden, things that are things that you thought were dear, or things that you thought were necessary, or things you thought all of a sudden they don't mean as much to you. You, you can just sort. Well, here they are. They're in this storm, and the ship has this load. The ship has this tackling, and all of a sudden, all of those things are not near as important as their life is. And so they're willing to get rid of whatever they need to get rid of if it helps them or if it improves their chances of survival. Now, there's, there's one other time in the Bible that we've seen this kind of activity on a ship. 
And that was on board, those men that were on board the, the boat that Jonah took back in Jonah chapter 1. And when that storm came up, man, they, they were trying to get rid of everything on the ship to save the ship. And finally they had to get rid of Jonah. He was the problem uh, before, the, before the sea was calmed. But anyway, so we have saw this in the Bible before. Verse number 20 says, And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared... So apparently they're caught in a storm that has, I guess the terminology would be stalled out. This, this thing we, we see all the time, don't you love how the, the meteorologists and the news media, they do everything that they can to strike fear. Now, now don't get me wrong, if there's a storm coming, thank God for the warning. I, I'm, not, I'm, I, you know, I'm not critical of that. But they, they really try their best to scare you to death, you know. And always the worst case scenario and all of that. But these, these men are actually caught up in a storm that is not moving. This thing is not moving 19 miles an hour or 20 miles an hour or whatever the case may be. This thing seems to just be going round and round. This, th this thing just seems to just keep on churning and, and whirling and beating and spinning day after day. The Bible says here, neither sun nor stars in many days appear. So they spent many days in the complete darkness. It goes on to say, and not so small tempters lay on us, now here's the phrase I mentioned just a moment ago. All hope that we should be saved was taken away. What a sad time. What a scary time. I, I, I promise you Tim would be scared. <laughs> they're, they're, in, they're in this storm. The storm doesn't seem to be moving. It's just circling round and, and round and round. And they haven't seen, they haven't seen, uh, they have seen no sun or stars in many days. They're, they're in darkness and, and they're in this storm and all hope that they, they in other words, they've lost all hope of survival. I, I've never been there. I don't know that I ever want to be there, but that's where they are. I'm, I'm trying to paint you a picture of how desperate this situation is. It's, it's a dare situation. Look at verse 21. Well, after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them. So they've been battling and they've been fighting for their lives for days now. And Paul finally has something to say. And, and look what he has the gall to say. And he said, sirs, you should have hearkened unto me. <laughs> what a bold man. Here he is, a few verses earlier, he gave them warning, you better not go on this journey, you better not, you better not go on this trip, if you do, you know, there's, there could be loss of lives, you're going to lose the boat, you're going to lose the burden, you're going to lose, you're going to lose all of this, and so many days just passed, and Paul hasn't said anything, and when he finally decides to say something, he says, sirs, I told you not to do this. And uh, I, I can imagine he got some looks from those sailors. I, I'm sure that they, what they wanted to do was punch a hole in him after speaking the obvious, you know. And uh, so he, he said, you should have hearkened unto me and not loosed from Creek and to have gained this harm and lost. And we, we're living in a, at a time when everybody wants to gain something. But I don't think there's anybody that's interested in gaining harm and loss. I, I think that's an interesting choice of words used in the Bible. What, what you have gained is harm and loss. What a horrible thing. Verse 22, he says, and now I exhort you to be of good cheer. Now, hold on just a minute, buddy. <laughs> I've about had enough of you. The first thing you do is rebuke us because we did what you told us not to do, and we're, we're dying out here. If you, did, if you haven't realized, it's dark. We have no control of the ship. This thing is going around and around in the wind. We, in, the, in the storm, we have no idea where we are. We have no idea what we're doing. We're, we're at the end of our rope, and you say, oh, why don't you just cheer up? Yeah, good news. Um, and now I exhort you to be of good cheer. Look at this. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. Now, I don't, I don't think you and I can really appreciate what a good message this was. Unless you've ever been in the situation or the condition where all possibility of your safety has been lost. You have no hope at all whatsoever of survival. The Bible said, just in a previous verse, all hope, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. And all of a sudden, this prisoner, this Jew, he stands up and he says, I want you to be of good cheer 
because not a single one of you is going to lose your life. I, I don't know about you, but I would be excited to hear such a great message in such a horrible time. Now, you're going to live. That's good news. The bad news is the ship's not going to make it. I would have said, who cares? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> the owner of the ship, he might care. Who's ever cargoes on this ship, they might care. But, you know, I, I love Tim. Just get me out of here. <laughs> Amen. Verse 23 says, For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. Now, I, I like this. Paul made it very clear to this group of men that this is, this is not my words. This is not my authority. I'm here on behalf of another, and the one that I'm here on behalf of just happens to be God. And I'm speaking his words. And, the, and by the way, the angel of God, what, could you imagine? Listen, again, you've got to realize the storm, the darkness, the ship falling apart, all hope is gone, and Paul says the angel of God stood by me this night. He's on this ship with us. He's right here. And he, and he has given me word. He has given me a message. I am delivering you that message. And here's the message. <laughs> Fear not. Too late for that, buddy. <laughs> I'm already scared to death. But from this point on, Paul, Paul says, Fear not. Saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar and lo, God hath given all them that sail with thee. What a wonderful place for a fear not. This angel of the Lord told Paul not to fear. It seems to me that Paul was also afraid for good reason. I would have been afraid. So the angel of the Lord, whose I am and whose I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Now, there's something else that I, I think we should notice here as well. From this point on, we should pay very close attention to the fact that it seems that Paul has taken over the authority of the ship. All of a sudden, this prisoner, this Jew, who was nothing more to them than uh, one of the prisoners that the centurion was in charge of to get from point A to point B, all of a sudden, this man has taken the leadership in the time of storm or in the time of trouble. I'll, I'll tell you, when the Apostle Paul is right with God and when the Apostle Paul is walking with the Lord, there, there is no one in the world better at that than he is. And this man is right with God. He spent some time alone with the Lord. The angel of the Lord has stood by him. He's gave him a message to deliver. And Paul is just going to take over charge of the ship. It's, it's, you know, it's almost like I, I'm the captain now. I'm in charge. I'm going to be called. And, and you'll see throughout the rest of this chapter, from this time forward, Paul is going to call all the shots. It's not going to be the centurion. It's not going to be the soldiers. It's not going to be the sailors. It's not going to be the captain of the ship. From this time forward, in the remainder of this chapter, Paul is going to be in charge. I'll tell you something. When trouble comes, there's always somebody that rises to the top. Trouble has come, and those other men may have been appointed to positions, but Paul is God's man. And in the midst of the worst storm of their life, God is going to use this man to deliver them in a storm. Thank God for the times down through the years when all hope was gone and trouble was as bad as it's ever been, God has been faithful to send a preacher with a message to encourage our hearts and to strengthen us along the way. That a blessing over and over in our lives. So they have, this, they have this message. Fear not, he said. Verse 25. So he's already said one time, be of uh, good cheer. Fear not, he said. Verse 24. Verse 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. <laughs> For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told us. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island, but when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, at mid, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near some country. So here uh, Paul said, Be of good cheer, for I believe God. I'll tell you something, if you want to be cheerful, believe God. 
You, you want to be, uh, the worst time in your life, you can have some cheer in your heart if you'll believe God. There, there, if you'll just believe God, I promise you, you can get through every difficulty that you face in life. When we get our eyes off of God, when we get our mind off the things of God, when we get our heart away from the Word of God, all we're going to have is discouragement and trouble and defeat. We're just going to be downcast. We're, we're, we're going to be down in the mouth. But if we can just believe God, we can be of good cheer in the absolute worst time possible. We can be of good cheer and not be fearful. Ain't that a blessing? They don't even know, these people don't even know where they are. The Bible said it's been 14 days, so it's been two weeks of them not even knowing where they are. They haven't seen the sun. They haven't, they haven't seen the stars. And, and they, they, the Bible says here that they are drew near some country. They can't see any land. They, they can't see how deep the water is. What a horrible voice. There, I, don't, I was thinking about this. I was reading this. I read it several times over the last several days. And, and I, the, you know, you ever been discombobulated? Is that a word? You, you ever been, uh, you lose your sense of direction or you uh, forget maybe where you are. I'm, I'm not that old. I haven't done that that many times. And if you're older than that, I'm not insinuating that you do that all the time. It's just that sometimes we see you want, no, I'm just kidding. But I, I think the only thing that could make this situation worse is you having no idea where you are. It's dark. They're in a ship that's falling apart. The storm is absolutely beating them to death, and they have no idea where they are. It would be a horrible thing. It says here, at midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. They don't even know where they are. Verse 28. And sounded and found it 20 fathoms. So they did, they, they, my understanding, they, they put some kind of weight on a line. You drop the line in the water. And when it reaches the bottom, you pull it up again, you measure that, see how far or how deep the water is. And so they found it 20 fandoms and they had gone a little further and they sounded again and found it 15, I think it's actually pronounced fathoms maybe. So it was 20 fathoms deep and now it's 15 fathoms deep and they let the line down again. So look, they understand that they're running the ground. They understand they're getting uh, close to ground. The, the bottom's coming up. They're getting near some shore. And so a phantom is six feet. So originally they were in 120 feet of water. And the next time they measured, they were in 90 feet of water. So it seems that they're fast approaching land. Verse 29 says, Then fearing, lest we should fall upon the rocks, they cast four anchors out, from, out of the stern and wished for the day. Now we've been making mention of repeatedly about this darkness and they, they have gotten some indication or some idea from this measuring that they're getting near land. And so they get afraid. You're afraid that you're going to be shipwrecked. And then you're afraid that you're going to be cast upon the rocks on some. I mean, it, it just doesn't matter which way you turn. There's trouble. There's a problem. And so they, they cast these anchors out. And I, I really like this, this little phrase. And they wished for the day. Well, things are always worse at night, aren't they? It seems that there's some kind of, of hope in man that uh, if, if I can just make it to tomorrow, surely everything will be better tomorrow. Sickness is worth it, worse at night. Sorrow is worse at night. Pain is worse at night. Fear is worse at night. And the reason that all of those things are worse at night is God didn't make us for the darkness. He made us for the light. And things in the dark, I, I don't know, <clears throat> maybe I shouldn't mention this. I don't know if you've ever had a toothache or not, but those things are very deceptive. In the daytime, that thing will get feeling better. And you'll think, oh, this is okay. I don't know what it is about that thing at night, but you want somebody to hit you in the head with a hammer. I'm not kidding. I asked my wife to do that one time. It just hit me in the head with a hammer, knocked me out. This thing hurts so bad. It, it, sometimes it hurts so bad you just pull it yourself. Ain't that right, Tyrone? Only a few of us men can do that. The rest of you sissies need to grow up. I'm just kidding. It was very loose. <laughs> Amen. 
I don't, I don't want another tooth. Lord, I'm so sorry. Please don't ever give me another toothache. But those things will kill you at night. They'll, they'll start feeling better in the day, and you'll say, well, I'll, I'll wait till tomorrow. I'll call the dentist tomorrow, or I'll, or I'll go to the dentist tomorrow. I'll get something. And, man, when that sun goes down and it gets dark, it's, it's horrible. Listen, things are wor- our sorrow is worse at night. It gets quiet, and our mind gets still, and we think about all the things. And our sorrow gets worse. Our pain gets worse. Our fear gets worse. These men, they're just wishing for the day. You know what I'm looking forward to? The day. I'm wishing for the day. We're in a world full of trouble. We're in a world full of sorrow. We're in a world where almost all hope is gone. I'm wishing for the day. Amen. Amen. Now, Paul's already told them that they're going to lose the boat. But in spite of that, they've, they've cast out four anchors. And they're, they're trying to save the ship. And, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not blaming them for putting up a fight. It's the nature of man to fight for survival. And they're fighting uh, for survival. Maybe, maybe they are even thinking that Paul doesn't know what he's talking about. I, I don't know. But they, they cast out the anchors. Verse 30 says... And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color, underline that, as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. So it seems, it seems as if these shipmen are ignoring what Paul has said and they're planning to abandon the ship. Now this little phrase under color means that they're pretending, they're pretending to do something that they're not doing. And so they're pretending to put these boats into the water to go out and perform some kind of useful repair or maintenance on the ship. But what they're actually intending to do is abandon the ship. But look what verse 31 says. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers. So he's talking, I told you Paul's in charge now. He tells the centurion and he tells the soldiers, except these, speaking about those sailors, those shipmen, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. So Paul told the captain, or or he he told the centurion and the soldiers, he said, listen, if you let these shipmen leave this ship, your life is in danger. You're not going to make it either. Not only are they not going to make it, you're not going to make it. So Paul is now appealing to their life, their desire to live. He didn't say they could not be saved. He said, if you are going to be saved, you're going to have to keep them on this boat. You're going to have to keep them on this ship. Now look at verse 32. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boats and let her fall away. So the soldiers, they believe Paul's word and praise the Lord, they believe Paul's word. And so they go over there where they have these these lifeboats, I assume. And they were going to let these lifeboats down into the sea. They were going to get down into those lifeboats. Here's my thinking on that. If this big ship you're in, we'll find out in a minute it's a big ship, is being beat to pieces by this storm and these waves. Who wants to get in a dinghy? <laughs> Man has a desire to save himself, and that's a good thing. And I, I guess they thought the ship was going to come apart. If I can get in this little boat, you know, maybe me and my four and no more, and we'll be okay. No, Paul said, if, if you leave this boat, you're going to die. If they leave this boat, not only are they going to die, you're going to die. And so the soldiers go over there and they take their swords and they cut the ropes on those boats and those boats fall into the sea and they float away. The only thing I can think about is this. Their absolute last hope of them saving themselves, God has just taken away. I'll tell you when you get help from God, When the very last thing that you can do in and of yourselves to rectify the situation is gone and you're totally dependent upon God, that's when he'll help you. So it seems that he's he's taken off all hope of them being saved. He's removed everything possible for them saving themselves and now they're going to have to trust him. So they're, they're stuck on that ship And Captain Paul is in charge. (laughs) He's telling the centurion what to do. He's telling the soldiers what to do. 
and they're obeying him. Now look at verse 33. And while the day was coming on. Ain't that a blessing? <laughs> They've been in the dark. There's been no sun. There's been no stars. There's been a storm. But now the day is coming on. Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. <clears throat> so not only... <laughs> Have they been in this storm and all of this trouble and all these problems? They haven't eaten in 14 days. Now, I don't think this fasting that they're doing is a religious thing. Of course, they, they might be fasting, hoping that their gods would answer them just like they were. I mentioned Jonah chapter 1 earlier, just like those men in, Jonah, in Jonah's day were, were begging and praying to their gods. I, I don't know, but I'm wondering, I'm thinking about this. I don't know if they were able to eat. I've never been in a storm like that. I don't want to be. But I've heard J.D. talk time and time again about those storms on that destroyer ship he was on and how sometimes that thing would be standing straight up in the air and you couldn't even see the bottom of the next wave where that thing fell to. Can you imagine riding the world's worst roller coaster there's ever been and trying to hold down a meal? <laughs> Don't seem like to me it would be very possible. So for 14 days, whatever the, whatever the case may have been, and, and by the way, fear takes away your appetite as well. So these men are afraid. They're in this storm. They haven't ate in, in 14 days. I want, I want you to notice something here. I want you to... Notice this in this verse, verse 33. Look at the second part of the verse. This day is the 14th day that, look what it says, ye. Paul didn't say we, he said ye. They haven't ate in 14 days, but apparently Paul has. I'll tell you something. It pays to be right with the Lord. Amen. Now, so... They're afraid. So Paul says, hey guys, let's have something to eat. Verse 34, Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not an hair of your head, a hair fall from the head of any of you. Now, Paul's told him to be of good cheer. He's told him not to fear. But now he tells him, listen, not only are none of you going to die, none of you are even going to be harmed. You're not even going to be injured. You're not even going to, uh, not even a hair of your head is going to fall out. Well, that happens if you, Walk under a limb, amen. I mean, your hair fall. All I got to do is look in the mirror, and mine falls out. But um, you, he said, not even a hair of your head's going to be harmed. You're, you're not going to die. You're not going to lose any any hair of your head. Nobody's going to be har harmed at all whatsoever. Now, here, here's the thing. At the beginning of this journey, I'm sure there were very few, if any, of these men who had any respect for the Apostle Paul at all. But now it seems like they are certainly coming around to, to liking him and, and to his favor. And uh, he's been calm. This has been an unbelievable storm. It's been a, an, a horrible 14 days, if you will. And yet the Apostle Paul has remained calm. He's remained patient. Uh, he's remained consistent. He's remained... You know, you know what the world needs to see from you and I? They need to see that the storms of life don't change us. They don't get us excited. They don't get us riled. They don't get us out of character or out of form. We just stay consistent through the storms of life. May the Lord help us to do that. Verse 35 said, And when he had thus spoken, he took bread. Now, here, here's a little, I, I like, I'm, I've mentioned several times. I'm going to continue to mention, Paul's in charge now. <laughs> and he, it's like Joseph back in the book of Genesis Paul is the top man. He, he is controlling everything. He's, he's in charge of the food supply. He's in charge of, of the food source. He's in charge when it's time to eat, when it's time not to eat. He's telling the soldiers what to do. He's telling the centurion what to do. And so now he's decided it's time to eat. And so he, the, the, the Bible says he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. And when they had, take, when they had broken it, he began to eat. So Paul has risen to the top. And, but Paul is not seeking the praise of men. Paul is not seeking the glory of men. He certainly takes time to give God thanks in the presence of all these men, uh, wanting them to understand that I'm trusting God. That's, that's why I am, appear to you to be the man that I am. It's not me. It's the God I serve, and you can trust him as well. 
Verse 36, what a, what a great verse. Then were they all of good cheer. <laughs> Paul's been of good cheer, now they're all of good cheer. You know what good cheer is? It's, it's contagious. People griping and complaining is contagious, but people of good cheer is contagious as well. And so they're, they're, the Bible says they're all of good cheer. And they also took some meat. Now, this is not a small vessel. Look at verse 37. And we were in all in the ship 200, three score, and 16 souls. So there's 276 souls on board this ship. And, you know, the Bible talks about in uh, Joseph when he took his family and he went down into Egypt that there were three score and 15 souls. The Bible talks about 3,000 souls that were saved on the day of Pentecost. So these are souls. God doesn't talk about bodies. He talks about souls. He's concerned about your soul. And so uh, he makes mention here about these 276 souls on the ship. And here, here's why I say that. Here's why I say that. Look at this. I want you to look back to verse 24 for just a moment. Back at verse 24 for just a moment. Saying, fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. Here's what I want you to look at. God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. God has given you all of these men. And then you look at verse number 37, and they're referred to as souls. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this for sure, but it almost leads you to believe that everybody on this ship got saved. Not only from death, but that their soul was saved. It's almost as if Paul won every single one of these men to the Lord during this storm. What better time to share Jesus with people than when things are dark and stormy? That's, that's where we're at in the world. Jesus is our only hope, amen. Verse 38 says, And when they had eaten enough, and when, we had, and when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. They don't need any more food. Might as well get rid of that. Verse 38 says, And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded if it were possible to thrust the ship. So here's this little waterway coming up and down. There's an opening into the sea. It's referred to as a shore, so it's a sandy shoreline or coastline, if you will. And so they're going to aim the boat at that creek, and they're going to hope that they can, can get in that, that direction, get the creek or, or the ship to uh, run aground or whatever the case is going to be in that direction. Verse number 40 says, And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands. So there's nothing to hold that. There's no way to control or direct the ship at all. It's on its own. They hoisted up the mainsail of the wind, the Bible says in the verse, and they made toward shore. So wherever the wind takes them, wherever the current takes them, that's where they're going to go. And we hope that we're pointed right into this creek, this shoreline, and then we can just step right out on the shore. And verse 41 says, And fall into, an, into a place where two seas meet, they ran the ship aground. Now, I don't know anything about all of this other than what I read. And apparently, when two seas meet together, there are converging currents. It's referred to as a race. And when these converging currents meet together, apparently that is not a good thing or anything that you want to be a part of uh, in the sea or in a boat or whatever the case may be because the, those currents will pull you right in or right under. Maybe, I, I don't know, I, I just thought of this, maybe it's something similar to a riptide or something, I, I don't know. But anyway, from what I understand, it's not a good thing. Uh, the Bible says, and we see the result of that, where those two seas meet, that the ship ran aground. So the only thing that is going to save them is the fact that the bottom of the sea rose up and uh, quicker than they could sink, and so the water wasn't deep enough for the ship to sink. Look at verse 41. And falling into a place where two seas meet, they ran the ship aground, and the fore part struck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. So the ship runs around, aground, the ship breaks apart into pieces. Verse number 42 says, And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. 
Now, before we get too overbearing with these soldiers here, maybe that was their training. Maybe they had been trained that if something happens, if there's a shipwreck or whatever the case may be, don't allow the prisoners to escape. You take their lives. I, I don't know. But anyway, the soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners. But I want you to notice how good this centurion is. Look at verse 43. But the centurion, willing to save Paul. He's a good man. Willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on boards. Somebody has said this is the first mention of surfboards. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they all, that they escaped all safe to land. Listen, that is exactly what God promised and that is exactly what God done. Now, I made mention earlier, the next time we come back to the, our study in the book of Acts, we'll look at the chapter again and we'll see how that this chapter with the ship, the sea, and the storm relates to our Christian life. Father, we thank you for this wonderful chapter in the Bible. What great reading, what many applications we can make to our life and to the goodness of our God and our Savior. Please help us, Lord, to realize that regardless of how dark the night gets, how long the storm lasts, how long it seems that we have to do without, our God does not change. We can faithfully put our faith and trust in you. What a wonderful Savior. Thank you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we thank you so much for coming, being a part of our afternoon service. Don't forget our service.